Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another fantastic episode on the Unleashing Potentials podcast. My name is Bernadette Desir, and I'm your host. And joining me today is Valerie. How are you? Great. How are you? I'm freezing, but great. <laughs> <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> Yeah, I'm good. I'm doing good. I'm happy to have you on the podcast, Valerie. Welcome to the Unleashing Potentials team. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I'm really honored that you asked me. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so Valerie, can you start by telling us where you're tuning in from? I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, mm -hmm. Okay. where it is nice and sunny. Oh, nice. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, surprisingly, it is sunny here. But unfortunately, it's freezing. Okay, well, we can talk in the summertime and you'll be glad you're not here. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. So Valerie, let's get started. Can you start by telling us who you are and what you do? I am Valerie Silvera and I am an author and a speaker and a courage coach. And um, my mission is really just to empower other women and their families, often we have men come to our events to, to overcome, basically overcome life. Because after you've lived on this planet more than a couple of decades, you know, something has blindsided you. And I really feel like at the core of everything is fear. And that's why I talk so much about courage, because I think it's incredibly important. And probably the number one thing is fear is what holds us back or keeps us down. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah. Um, Valerie, can you take us back to your childhood? Kind of walk us through what it was like and how it has shaped you into the woman that you are today. Oh, wow. All the way back to my childhood. Okay, then. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> little did you know, that's where the adversity began. <laughs> it, 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 it typically does. <laughs> yes. So without telling my entire story, um, Mm -hmm. My mother was an only child. She was a straight A student. And when she was 16 years old, she got pregnant, a guy that was 21 and mm -hmm. had 13 kids in his family and a completely different childhood from my mother's. And back then, you know, you didn't just go to school. So instead of going to college where she had scholarships waiting for her, she had to quit school and then come back the following year after she had my brother then by the time she was 20, there were three of us and there was really no mechanism back then either to cause fathers to pay child support. So he paid it whenever he felt like it. He didn't show up when he said he would. I mean, it was very chaotic also in the fact that, you know, my mother, I, I understand now as a grown woman, how disappointing life must have been for her. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you're a kid, all you know is that your mom's unhappy all the time and she's crying all the time. And, and mm -hmm. I actually have not said this to very many people and really haven't made this public because my mom is still alive. And, mm -hmm. and I love my mom, even though all the chaos and drama we were in as children. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was seven, my mom took a bottle of pills and um, I was the one who found the pills and knew that my mom didn't really have the flu <laughs> mm -hmm. and that she'd really not been to the hospital for that. And I kept that mm -hmm. secret for 20 years. And there were just, there were a lot of chaotic things. My mom was also a hardworking person, a good person, even though our house was not a happy home. Mm -hmm. And at one point she took in one of my biological father's many siblings and her daughter and her husband knew where we lived and he broke our door down and he would come in and beat her up while my mom was working late at the meat packing plant. Yeah. And it was just a lot of chaos. And, you know, thankfully through that, I had a good sense of humor, which is always helpful. <laughs> Yeah. And, um, I was always, you know, outgoing and I was smart. Mm -hmm. So I always could get good grades. That was my thing. Like, let me be good at this. Um, but it's kind of interesting when you look back at your childhood and you think now I understand why organization and order is so important to me. It was my way of keeping my life in order. Uh, so anyways, fast forward to me having, um, mm -hmm my children and I was married, but I got divorced at one when my children were one and three. Mm -hmm. And, but my household was very different. I worked really, really, really hard to make sure that my kids didn't feel fear. Like I always felt as a child. Um, I didn't share adult things with my kids and my kids will tell you, would tell you that they had a happy home. Um, I know you asked about my childhood and I sped mm -hmm. past it because no worries. You know, what's really weird about that, Bernadette? Do tell Sometimes when you're, 
you know, you're an adult and you're going through these major things and you look back at your childhood and you go, oh, well, that was no big deal. You mm -hmm. don't realize the imprint of the trauma on you. Yeah. Um, and, and it was funny because I went in my early thirties to a psychologist. I can't even remember honestly why I went, but I was wanting to just work <laughs> through something. Yeah. He yeah. would always ask me about these things. Mm -hmm. And so he heard all the details that, you know, the details I'm not going to bother to share, but all the different things that I had experienced as a child. And he'd always go, well, how did that make you feel? And I go, I don't know. It was a long time ago. What does it matter? Mm. You know, you just want me to cry. Will, you, will I pay you more if I cry? You know, what's the deal? <laughs> and so yeah. my daughter, Jamie was about five at the time. And one day he says to me, what if every single thing you've shared with me about your childhood, what if all of that happened to Jamie mm -hmm. and the thought of all of that happening to my baby? Mm -hmm. I forgot that I was someone's baby, you know? I'm God's baby. Like I forgot all of that. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, when he put in that perspective that, oh my gosh, what if Jamie had to go through that? I bawled my eyes out. I went through like two, two boxes of tissues, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when I could finally step aside and go, wow, that was little Valerie that went through that. Yeah. And, but I don't like to be a victim. I don't like to. So mm -hmm. I just kind of stuffed all that away. And, but I do think it's important for us to revisit it and be gentle with, you know, little girl, whoever, Mm -hmm. So we can understand some of the ways that we are now mm -hmm. and why, why we're that way. And maybe we can uncover, you know, some deep hidden issue <laughs> that is causing yeah. us to be that way. And so I would just kind of avoid adversity, right? I mean, I thought I'll just keep it all together and, you know, single mom or not, I'm hardworking. I'll take good care of my children. We live in a safe area. We live in a good home. You know, I was remarried when my kids were 10 and 12, you know, we'll just, everything will just be happy and peachy and, you know, we'll make sure, mm -hmm. you know, my kids are in youth group and they're in sports and I'll just make sure mm -hmm. that everything I can steer the ship. Well, let me tell you something, sister, <laughs> I learned something <laughs> about the ship. <laughs> um, yeah. I've learned that we have very little control over most of life. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, too little. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, for me, I've discovered it's what we think, what we say, what yeah. we do. And by the way, even our feelings we can control to it to an extent. Yeah. Yeah. Because we get to decide what we do with them once they come. Mm. But beyond that, really, what do we control? And so I was under this false pretense that I could just control. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean control by telling my, you know, making my kids do things. I don't mean that control. I could control, mm -hmm. control their environment mm -hmm. and teach them everything they needed to know. They would not grow up in chaos and drama and all that stuff. And so I was pretty certain how they might turn out. Yeah. 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 Well, and then life had other ideas. It always does. <laughs> it always does. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. I, I honor you and I appreciate you and woman to woman. I can feel the, the warrior vibe and uh, all the um, incredible uh, traumatic things that life has thrown at you that you have overcome somehow. And then, yeah, and that and, yeah. and that wasn't even the bit. Those aren't the big ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Take us to some of the. I call them the small T trauma, big T trauma. Take us through some of the big traumas. Yeah. So you know, it's kind of funny. As I said earlier, I mm -hmm. consider that my childhood the little T's. I like how you said. I like that. I'm stealing that. <laughs> By the way, I'm stealing that. Okay. Small so T trauma. Know big that. T trauma. Know in advance, I'm stealing that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but little. Yeah. It's funny how because it happened to me. They're mm -hmm. little T's. Mm. But when things happen to my children, you know, it has to do with my children. It becomes the massive T, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. but it, it's certainly my trauma. So yeah. my daughter, Jamie, literally the mm -hmm. most gifted person I know. And I'm not saying that because she's my child, mm -hmm. but really this was a kid who's so left-brained and right-brained and I mean, logical and funny and quick-witted. I'm quick. This girl's quick. <laughs> but at the same time, artistic and she could paint and she had a beautiful singing voice and many things that I didn't, wasn't gifted with. Mm -hmm. And so I used to say when she was even a toddler, mm -hmm. she'd be the first woman president. Like, this is a leader. <laughs> this is the girl that all her cousins, she was the Pied Piper. So when she's about 15, just, I don't know if I'm supposed to, even, I don't know if you're, you're okay if I said a swear word. So I better be, right. I better be a good girl. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. 
the shit hit the fan. Okay. So all hell broke loose mm -hmm. and she was in youth group and she was actually with this youth group and doing inner city work. And instead of her reaching out to them, she sort of became them mm -hmm. uh, to put it, put, put it bluntly. So before long, she's off with this guy and we can't seem to control her. She quits youth group. She quits select sports. She played on the high school softball team. She pretty much quit her friends. She quit school. I became certified as a homeschool teacher because I didn't know what else to do. Mm -hmm. The first thing I did was test her. She tests at college level. So she's like, yeah, no, 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 thanks. Don't need school anymore. Mm. And she always had gotten good grades. She was always it just it was crazy. OK, mm -hmm. so I started thinking alcohol, drugs, because her father, not my husband at the time, you know, my now husband, but her father had struggled with those things. And I thought that has to be it. But I never found any evidence. She was very smart and crafty. And yeah. so anyway, when she was 18 years old, she had gone off to live with her dad because the rules at my house were too much for her. Mm -hmm. And I came home from a breakfast meeting to be met by my husband in the garage telling me Jamie's been shot. Ooh. He finally shot her Val, is what he said. And that, you know, tilted my world on its axis. And so what happened was it was a terrible, terrible situation where these two terrible thugs, Jamie's boyfriend turned out to be a gang member, just as I had suspected. We lived nowhere near any of that, by the way. It was yeah. so bizarre. It was like she sought all this out. And these two guys unloaded guns on a house where he knew she was. And one bullet hit one person and it was Jamie and it was near fatal. It was an absolute miracle that she lived through it. Yeah. So she was cut. It was, it went, mm -hmm. entered through the backside of her, but it's considered an abdominal gunshot wound mm -hmm. with no exit wound. So the bullet was inside of her and she, they cut her open emergency <laughs> surgery from her breastbone to her pubic bone. Like I, I like to say, my daughter was flayed open like a fish. And they just spent hours cauterizing, try, trying to stop the bleeding. And mm -hmm. then literally told me, you know, these kind of wounds are fatal. And we're just going to wait and see if she wakes up. Yeah. So, you know, 50 staples later and all of this and the most minimal damage you could possibly have from that kind of a an injury with a bullet traversing your abdomen. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a miracle, right? Yeah. And what, you know, we're in the hospital registered under a fake name, all of this stuff that you watch on dateline mm. right or 48 hours it doesn't happen to people like us and so one night in the hospital she says mommy will you pray with me and i go whoa jamie's never asked me that okay so i start praying like you know like i'm in a, a baptist preacher or something mm. and i'm thinking it's all going to be okay now everything's going to be okay jamie's coming back this is how i like to describe it Mm -hmm. I needed to put on my seatbelt and buckle down my shoulder harness because mm -hmm. the ride on the roller coaster from hell was about to get a lot worse. Mm -hmm. So she wound up addicted to the opiates that they prescribed her after the shooting. Mm -hmm. And eventually she was addicted to heroin. Oh. So remember, she was supposed to be the first woman president. And I'm sitting here going, mm -hmm. now I have to use the words Jamie and heroin in the same sentence. Mm. I, I can't get my head wrapped around this. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, for 13 years, I rode that roller coaster from hell, like painfully up one hill and screaming down the next, just terrified all the time, 24 hours a day, terrified and trying to fix it and change it and make it happen. And, you know, I bailed her out of every situation you could imagine, trying to save her, trying to, you know, if I don't, then what if? If I don't, then what? Yeah. So it became my responsibility. I was her mother. Mm -hmm. I lived in terrible, terrible guilt because it had to be my fault. Mm -hmm. I'm her mom. I raised her. I had to have done something wrong. So you go through the list, you know, of every moment of their life thinking, oh, it was the time I said this, you know, that one little time I said that or did this mm -hmm. that caused it mm -hmm. or, you know, what? and then, then there was shame at the time. I didn't know anybody mm -hmm. who had a son or daughter in addiction. Mm -hmm. So obviously I was not only a terrible mother, I was a horrible human being. I'd let everyone down. I let God down. I let, I mean, it just, you go through the list and pretty soon your self-worth is in the toilet mm -hmm. and you're just trying to survive. And, you know, there's no question I'm, I have PTS going on yet. I can't, but the war is still happening, right? I haven't come home and now I'm working on my PTS. I'm still living in it. 
Mm-hmm. And so it was really kind of, you know, we were talking earlier before this that we sometimes think we have to get it all sorted out and then we can go unleash our potential as you talk about all the time. Yeah. But sometimes it's our lowest points. Like the, the lowest point can be the most important for us. Yeah. So yeah. what happened for me is I used to cry in the walk-in closet. So my husband wouldn't know because we both work from home and mm-hmm. just, I didn't want anyone to feel sorry for my own. My own family read my first book, which is called still, uh, yeah, still standing after all the tears. And some of them read that book and went, oh my God, Val, we had no idea you were feeling this way, mm-hmm. you know, cause I'm running around pretending everything's okay. Yeah. So one day I remember standing in my kitchen and it, it, this thing just blurted out of my mouth with no control. It just came up. Mm-hmm. And I said to my husband, I don't want to be here anymore. It's too hard. That's how I was feeling every moment of every day, mm-hmm. smiling on the outside, dying on the inside, because I couldn't save mm-hmm. the, per- the, she was my first love, my first child. You know, I just, I, and I knew I wasn't being the best mom for Sean, her son, her brother, who was two years younger and just, mm-hmm. I would just, it was too much. So, mm-hmm. but here's the cool thing. When I heard my mouth say that, you know, when I heard my voice. Mm-hmm. And it went into my head and my heart. I went, oh, whoa, no, 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 uh-uh. That cannot be my legacy. Nope. There's no way that I was put on this earth for that to be the period at the end of my story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I started clawing my way. You know, I just, I didn't know where I was going or, you know, how I was going to get there, but I knew that I had to fight. Yeah. Initially, I just, I fought for my son. I thought, he's not going to lose his sister and his mom. I mean, I'm not going to let that happen. That's not fair. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, I just went through all this. I ended up writing my first book and I've written other books and workbooks and ha- have some, had some events um, that help other women to feel, you know, ignited and that they can overcome and that it's okay to be okay when the most important person in your life is crashing. And um, mm-hmm. anyway, that's, that's the first part of my big fat T. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, I, I'm so sorry you had to go through that. I think losing a child is probably one of the hardest lessons that we come down here on earth to, to witness and it's painful. And I don't have words because I'm a mom. Um, I'm not going to say I understand because it hasn't happened to me. I can only imagine what that was like or what it is still like you know losing losing your daughter so my condolences to you and I I you're welcome and I honor your resilience and and everything you've shared and um well so the thing about it is is that I was losing her for 15 years 13 of them was I rode the roller coaster then I got off I pulled the emergency brake and somehow I got off I, I realized I was dying and I had to self-destructing along with her wasn't helping. It was compounding the yeah. problem. But I'm going to tell you what, for, you know, for anyone who might be listening, who knows somebody who ha- is a mom or even a dad of someone in addiction, you have no idea what yeah. it's like to try to just take a breath each day when your kid is dying in front of your face. And the only person that can save them is them, mm-hmm. you know, but addiction rep- rep- appeal, repeals mm-hmm. treatment. Like it's the only disease I know of that doesn't want treatment. Like every, you know, everything else you get, you go find treatment. Yeah. Um, so it's very difficult for you to even imagine and just, you know, having compassion and because we feel like mm-hmm. so alone, you can't even explain it, but I can tell you one thing. I'm glad I had that low point. I'm so mm-hmm. thankful that I did because had I not done what I did mm-hmm. two years, about two years later, it was two 12 years and 12 days after she was shot, when she was 18, Mm -hmm. I got the knock on the door that every parent dreads, Mm -hmm. you know, it's that, that thing that you as a mom, Bernadette, when that subject comes up of losing a child, you get that physical sick feeling and you just go, no, no, no. Don't want to talk about it. Think about it. It's, it's, you can't, it's, it's not something you can get your head around. And even if they're Mm -hmm. in addiction and you know that, you know, there aren't any old addicts out there. It, it you know, it's not going to end well if they don't overcome their beast, but you still can't prepare for it no matter what. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, my knock on the door, Jamie did not overdose. She was murdered. And so I have 
now going, she was shot twice. Who knows someone who was shot once? And now it's fatal. And um, so anyway, that, believe it or not, was almost eight years ago. It seems like eight days ago. Mm -hmm. And um, we still don't have justice. So on top of having my daughter gone and the murder, we still have, uh, he was on the loose for two and a half years. They finally arrested him. Mm -hmm. He's been pulling all sorts of shenanigans that have delayed the trial. And so we're still waiting, but thankfully he's in jail and we're still waiting to get to a point. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, we also had to go to a preliminary hearing where we had to hear you know, how many times he shot her and where, and that she begged for her life and very, very traumatic things and trauma in our future, because we now know what a trial is going to be like emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what I really wanted to talk about today that I thought would be helpful for your listeners, because listen, some people might say, well, I don't have anything, you know, this terrible or this traumatic, but we shouldn't compare the things that we go through because Mm. they're all real mm -hmm. and yes. they're all little or big T's. Like you said, they're all real to each of us. And yeah. you, we, we can't say, well, let me just diminish that because, you know, Valerie or whoever is going through or has been through these other things. Yeah. So I want, you know, you need to give yourself the grace to say, wow, mm. this is hard, but then what do we do with it? Because if we wind up becoming a victim Okay. So they call us victims. We are, we have a victim's advocate. Jamie was a victim. We are victims as a family. I will accept that in the legal sense, but mm -hmm. I don't want to live my life as a victim mm -hmm. because I, like I say, this guy blew a hole in my heart. I mean, I live every day with a crater, the size of the grand Canyon in my heart. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not going anywhere. It hasn't shrunk in almost eight years yeah. because it's my daughter, but Here's what I've learned. Oh my gosh. The more you give away your heart, it becomes bigger. It's this weird phenomenon. <laughs> it defies physics. So you can live with the pain and the grief and everything, and you can still live with joy and happiness and hope and everything else. If you're willing to do the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so can you kind of walk me through a, a bit with a bit more details of what happened? So she, she was shot she went to the hospital, they did surgery, and then she was... No, the first the time she was shot, they did the surgery, and she was... Okay. And then 12 years later, 12, she okay. was shot seven times. There was no... You know, she... It was... You know, she was... It, it And and what she was shot over is something so minor that you can't even believe it. I mean, we're literally just scratching our heads. But, you know, sadly, the world of addiction is dangerous in many ways that people don't think about. You know, you think about the obvious, oh my gosh, taking too many drugs and you die. And of course, nowadays with fentanyl, you barely look at the stuff and you can die. But um, the dangerous world they live in, there's danger. I mean, there people are literally looking for their next fix and no one can trust each other. And just, it's a really uh, danger. And that's why I had to kind of um, distance myself from Jamie, not in an angry way, but I told her, you know, Jamie, this is the, what my life looks like. You know, we live with integrity and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we want you in it, but it's only fair for you to understand what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And out of respect for us, she kind of just stayed away, but any, any communication, I, this is the one thing that I think is the biggest gift of all of this is that the last communication I had with her, not knowing it'd be a few weeks before her, her death Mm -hmm. she said to me, mommy, I'm so proud of you. Mm. And I tell everyone about you. And they found my, my book still standing after all the tears and a workbook in her belongings after she died. And the reason I think that's a, it's a gift for me to have her say that, but I think it's more than that mm -hmm. because all the other years, when I was guilt tripping her, when I was, you know, trying to force her, when I was doing all the other stuff, mm -hmm. she never told me she was proud of me. She was proud of me when I stood up and fought and took my life back mm. and started going out and using this adversity for good. Mm -hmm. That's when she was proud of me. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And you know what? Everything can be used for good. So whatever you've been through, and I think what's so important to understand, I mentioned this to you before we started this broadcast, mm -hmm. that people often think, well, I better go get it all together first. 
then I will unleash that potential. Then I will become this. And first of all, can I just tell you, here's when you're going to have it all together. Never. <laughs> That's what I was thinking too. <laughs> right. It's yep. Like, okay, you take your last breath. You still don't have it all together. Yeah. Um. Yep. So, but, and so I remember when I wrote my first book and I, and I said to my husband, oh my gosh, oh no. Oh, oh, what if nobody likes it? What if it doesn't make a difference? And then I said, you know what? If even one person likes it, that's one person that yeah. can get better because yeah. of what I've been through. Um, but I, you know, of course I had that fear and I thought, well, they're going to find out because I'm so transparent. They're going to find out I don't have it all together. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, all those perfect people out there trying to pretend they're perfect. They're not. <laughs> oh my God. I, I'm going to have a, I decided I'm going to have a perfect person party. We're going to have an event and it's going to be held in a phone booth because everyone that's perfect can fit in there. <laughs> right? I love I love your energy thank you for sharing I love it um so walk us through your healing journey I think uh, I have a, a feeling that you're still walking that journey oh my never-ending journey walk how do you how do you it. and I not already know each other because you literally just took words straight out of my mouth <laughs> I was psychic. gonna say I'm still on it sort of psychic yeah, I think you must be because I, I am. am I'm actually oh. am. Oh, okay. Well, you got I'm, it. Girl. I'm not. I'm not trained, but as you were speaking, you have I, intuition. I, 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 sometimes very through strong. through thoughts, and I could. I, yeah, she she said, "I'm. I am so sorry, mom. She didn't know it would have happened that day, or that it could have gotten that bad, that fast." Oh, thank you so she, much. Please. She sees and she knows the amount of pain and everything you've been through. She she has some guilt on her end, but she's asking you to also release it on your end to 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 live live. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, and I and I think that you brought up such a good point because the guilt is, I mean, guilt will eat you alive. Oh, it will. Yeah, and you have to release it, but. The problem I had during her addiction, I realized later when I finally did release the guilt, mm -hmm. is that we are all looking for, you know, inquiring minds want to know. We're all looking for the answer, the reason, the, the you know, how this came about. And we need to know. We need to put some order to things. Mm -hmm. And so because I couldn't figure out who to blame for this addiction, mm -hmm. I just pointed the finger at myself. Mm -hmm. You know, it was easier for me to blame myself, even though I didn't hold her down and put any drugs in her. Mm -hmm. It was easier for me to blame myself than even to blame her mm -hmm. or the drug dealers or the friends or whatever. Um, so the guilt that I could have, should have, I, I call these three, I actually named, I actually started writing a fiction book that I've never published. And mm -hmm. one of the chapters in its scenarios are these three characters called coulda, woulda, and shoulda. Mm -hmm. And you know, I really named them and those two, three will take you down too. Mm -hmm. you know, we spend so much time going, well, I could have, should have, would have, well, yeah, sure. If you, if hindsight was 2020, you'd know what to do, but <laughs> nobody has this crystal ball that tells us everything to do, right? We don't know yeah. at the future. And so we're doing the best we can with what we have. And mm -hmm. I finally had to realize this is literally the thing yeah. that was an epiphany for me. I said, mm -hmm. if I could have saved Jamie, if that, if I had the ability to save my daughter, I would have done it a long time ago. Mm. Oh my God. It's not that I didn't pray hard enough, try hard enough, put enough money at it, save her enough times. I never had that much power in the first mm. place. Mm. And for you to kind of succumb to that realization that she's on her journey. Mm -hmm. And yes, our journeys are intertwined and they impact other people. Mm -hmm. Each person is responsible for their path and their journey and their, and so, I, I mean, so you say like, what was my healing journey at first? Literally it was clawing my way. Just how mm -hmm. in the world can I be happy? I'm talking about real joy. I mean, not that smile on the face, Valerie's the life of the party. She's a jokester, all that. No real. Yeah. True. Yeah. If I could be th that for one hour, mm -hmm. that was my initial goal. One hour. I, and then, of course, then it was like, what if a day I could have a whole day mm. where I didn't want to, you know, not be here anymore or mm -hmm. cry, my, cry myself to sleep in the walk-in closet. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just really started going through all of the wisdom that I had collected over all the many years I'd been on the planet 
and all the different people that had helped me and things that I'd learned and started to do things. And then people would say, wow, you seem to be better. You know, what are you doing? And that's why I initially, in my first book, I, um, I introduced the nine actions to battle your beast because we're all living with some kind of beast, right? Ooh, Shame, guilt, you know, codependency, whatever. <laughs> and, um, I yeah. now call them nine, nine, the nine weapons of hope. Cause I've kind of made it of it more of a digital program and, uh, yeah. Kind of just learned more, you know, as life has gone on, but they're pretty much the premise is the same. Mm -hmm. And there are these nine things that, that help. And so mm -hmm. really the, the first thing is that you decide that that's literally the first of the weapons is about decisions. You have to decide because yeah. you know what, if you don't decide. Someone will. Exactly. It, it's not going to happen. <laughs> you need to decide and you have yeah. to fight for what you know, decide that you're going to stand up and fight. And that you're going to stay in the ring until the final round yeah. and you can get knocked down. Like I, I picture literally the beast on top of me whispering in my ear, you're a terrible mother and, you know, laughing at me and, mm -hmm. and me fighting and fight. And you know what? Eventually I was able to get on one knee and then eventually I was able to stand and he knocked me back down and I just kept mm -hmm. getting back up. Yeah. So when you said earlier, you know, your journey mm -hmm. to healing, well, yeah, it's still happening. So here's the big difference between me and a lot of people who aren't where I am. I've fallen down and gotten back up more times. Yeah. I mean, that that's probably truly what it is. So mm -hmm. I had to really work on, on letting go of guilt mm -hmm. and shame mm -hmm. and stigma. <laughs> Those things really had me. Um, mm -hmm. And I refuse, I refuse society's stigma. They can think whatever they want about me, but I can tell you one thing. I, I am still a good mom. Yes. And you so that, you know, was I perfect mom? No, because they don't exist, but I am not going to take responsibility for Jamie's addiction. Mm -hmm. So but that took me a long, you know, a long, it was a long journey. Mm -hmm. Another one was what I call the F word. And <laughs> that other F word was used plenty of times on my journey too, <laughs> as you can imagine, but I'm talking about forgiveness and it seems kind of like a buzzword, but yeah. For us to forgive, for me to forgive this, when I first came up with this, it was like, oh, I have to forgive the guy that shot her. Remember, she's still alive. Mm. I've got to forgive this guy. And I would start praying for him that he would become a good person, that mm. he would, you know, why would I want him to be a bad person and hurt someone else? And it, that was huge for me to do that. I had to forgive the addiction beast. I had to forgive Jamie for all the lies and the deceit and for, you know, everything she'd allowed her, her life to become. And, mm -hmm. and here's the big one. I'd use the F word on myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the hardest thing for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. They find it easier to forgive like the person who hurt them the, the most than themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I had to say whatever, any part I may have had in all this, I forgive myself for all of it. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I had to release all that because it was killing me. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And um, I mean, you know, there are, there are nine different things, but another thing that I think is so important and fits well with what you talk about is that the ninth one is really in, in the nine actions. I call them, called it make meaning from the madness. Mm. Now I just call it your legacy, but here's the deal. All of our legacies are happening right now. Even if you're not thinking about it, you're not working on it. You're not aware of it. It doesn't matter. It is happening mm -hmm. because little pieces of us get deposited in other people. Yeah. Like after this, after our meeting today mm -hmm. and me seeing your beautiful face, I know you can't see mine. You'll have to picture me That's all right. after me and having just, you know, little connections, mm -hmm. you've made imprint on me. Yeah. So now, you know, the big T and the little T, for example, I take that out and I go carry that somewhere else. And I, I leave that with someone. Mm -hmm. Here's the coolest thing ever. That means Bernadette, a piece of you just went inside someone else that you don't even know through me. And so I feel like we're, we're depositing ourselves in people. And so a piece of us, all of us will live on in the world forever, long after we're gone. Mm. And so if our legacy is happening now, shouldn't we be thinking about it? Mm. Yeah. It's, it's a real responsibility. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was part of the big, you know, the big thing that I said is mm -hmm. I can't allow this to be the end of my story. I can't allow, I won't put a period on the end of it. I'm going to put a comma. Yeah. yeah. Jamie was an addiction. You know, Jamie died. Jamie was murdered. Mm -hmm. Comma. Yeah. 
Whew. Yeah. 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 Thank you for sharing. Um, as you were talking, I, I, I don't know, I write as I listen. Yeah, me too. I, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm hearing pain, purpose, power, resilient, uh, hope, all of it. And I, I love your story. And um, I think there's beauty and pain because yes. what is the purpose of feeling high all the time without understanding what it's like to be low, right? And I love yeah. that you you practice forgiving um, the situation, the people, and yourself. I was about to say forgiving yourself, and then you mentioned it as well. And that is, it's very hard. <laughs> it's, it's, take it from me as well. It's very hard to forgive the self because we blame ourselves for other people's actions. I know, but then you know what you think? I thought to myself, who do you think you are? Really? <laughs> yeah. You think well, it's all about you? <laughs> you like you have that much power and that much responsibility yeah. in the yeah. world? Come on. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But especially, I think it's especially difficult if it's something happening to a child, mm -hmm. because you do have that initial responsibility. But you know, I know so many people mm -hmm. that are out there still parenting and their kids are in their 40s or whatever. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> Your job is to equip them. Yeah. Right. And so I, I was actually on a, on a podcast one time and I don't, I, I think it may have been even before or after she really shared her feelings with me. Her daughter had mm -hmm. died of a fentanyl overdose. Mm -hmm. And um, she just said, I feel like none of my parenting has mattered. I, all, mm -hmm. This is what I did to parent. You know, you go through the list of all the good parenting things you did. Yeah. And then this is the outcome. Cause we're very tied to what we put into it, what we get out of it, right? Yeah. The results. Mm -hmm. And she said, so none of it mattered. I said, but it all mattered. Mm -hmm. Of course it mattered because even when Jamie was out there in that world that I didn't really want any part of, I've had so many people contact me and say she was a beautiful person. And these are people, a lot of them are in addiction and mm -hmm. said she was the best friend. She talked about you all the time. It mattered. Mm -hmm. You know, even in that crazy little world she was living in, it still mattered mm -hmm. she still mattered to people mm -hmm. and uh, but anyway i just think that for for parents we 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 have this responsibility we think until like you know we're dead mm -hmm. but we lose con i don't know how old your kids are so maybe i shouldn't say this to you but that's okay <laughs> you lose control of your kids a lot sooner than you think let me just put yeah. it that way yeah. and so it is important what we instill in them but it's not a guarantee mm -hmm. I that they're that. going to make the right choices or that they're not going to come in contact with somebody that's going to, you know, lead them in a, in a wrong direction. There's no guarantees in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. We just have to do what we do and do the best we can. Yeah. 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 I agree. Um, you know, why I asked about your childhood, which I I've been asking all guests because that's where it all began. Believe it or not, it began there. And, oh, I had a shitty childhood and I felt that I, I have had to raise myself. And here I am now as a mom, my kids are teaching me how to parent. That may sound bad, but no, I think no, I we get can that. learn from our kids. Sure. Yeah. But you, mm -hmm. I mean, but you know, it's funny you say that because my mom <laughs> is 81 now and she's doing a lot of self-reflection mm -hmm. and my mom's not that kind of person. She's not a real introspective person. <laughs> In fact, she probably was very ill-equipped to even be a parent. She wasn't the nurturing, loving kind, you know, but now she's going through, she's doing that inventory and mm -hmm. she's got a little bit of, of memory issues and, you know, some kind of dementia setting in. Mm -hmm. And so she's going through the list a lot over and over. And so she repeatedly says, you know, you and your brothers, I, I was just this terrible mom and, and uh, blah, 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 blah. And then she goes, you guys had to raise yourselves and I said, now, first of all, mom, every time you tell us how badly you feel about our childhood makes me think you think we didn't turn out very well. <laughs> we all turned out well. So quit saying that. But here's yeah. the thing you're going to relate to. Mm -hmm. I finally said to her, okay, yeah, we did have a rough time. I'm not going to deny that. Mm -hmm. We raised ourselves. I said, well, you're mm -hmm. welcome because we did a darn good job of it then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's what I say to you. Good job. You yeah. raised yourself very well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so Valerie, can you tell us how are you impacting and helping those who have been in either the exact or similar situation as you? Uh, well, you can go to my website at ValerieSilvera.com. There you can be led to warriorsandhope.com, which is where you can get the nine weapons of hope, 
and some coaching. We have a sisterhood uh, where, you know, just like-minded people can come together and not commiserate, mm -hmm. but, yeah. you know, link arms, yeah. you know, in it with courage and with hope and, yeah. and people who get it, because lots of times we try to reach out for um, support from people who don't get it. And like you said, though, it doesn't have to be the same exact story. Mm -hmm. You know, trauma is trauma and loss is loss. And we all wind up having a lot of the same feelings and struggles and challenges. Mm -hmm. So we work through that together. I have written books and workbooks that can be found on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And um, we have events. It, kind of uh, COVID put a little bit of a wrench in all of that. And then I ended up moving to Phoenix and we haven't had an event in a few years, but we have had a few events and I plan to do more of those. Mm -hmm. I'm really going to start working on doing a lot more speaking. And I think it's just really important for all of us to come out of the shadows yeah. and stop being afraid to tell our stories because mm -hmm. every single person mm -hmm. out there needs somebody. They're, they're waiting for somebody to inspire them in some way. They don't know who, they don't know where they're going to come from. They might not even know they're waiting but every single person, whenever I have events too, I don't, I don't put up, you know, famous speakers. I like to bring up some of my warrior ladies and let them tell their stories. And they're all kind of nervous because they're not professional speakers. And I say this to every one of them, mm -hmm. every single one of you understand this. They may come to see me, but somebody's going to tell you they left changed because of you. Mm. And so I think what's really important, and I'm not talking about puking all over everybody your sad tale because <laughs> they're dealing with their own stuff and we don't need to be bringing people down yeah. and I think a lot of these so-called support groups are like that where mm -hmm. everyone's just one downing each other as I call it like oh you think your life is bad listen to this mm -hmm. so I think it's really important for us to mm -hmm. make sure that we are sharing that we can share our pain but we should be sharing not the wound but the scar mm -hmm. Right. This this is what how are we getting better moving forward? So mm -hmm. that's just what I'm all about is speaking out so that you know how many women have told me that they were slinking around mm -hmm. so ashamed to have a son or daughter in addiction until I came along and said, Well, guess what? You want to know what a mom of an addict looks like? Mm -hmm. It looks like a single parent, it looks like a politician, it looks like an actor, it looks like a firefighter, it looks like somebody on welfare, it looks like a CEO. Mm -hmm. They have, you know, every color of skin and black hair and red hair and blonde hair. And <laughs> most of us have gray hair <laughs> at some point. Um, but you know yeah. what we look like? We look like you. Mm. Yeah. We look like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Absolutely. Wow. You just uh, swooped me off my chair. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. Um, is there anything else we didn't touch on that you would like to share with my audience as we wrap up? Well, I just want to leave them with this thought. Mm -hmm. We avoid adversity like the plague, right? We, we try mm -hmm. to avoid adversity. We try to go around it and under it and make a U-turn. We do everything we can to avoid the tough stuff in life. I mean, duh, of course, everybody would like <laughs> life to be smooth sailing, Yeah, but that's not where we grow. It's not where we learn. And I know you don't like me to say that, mm. but it is true that we don't, we don't grow in the, in the easy times. Yeah. It's not saying you can't, but we don't typically. Mm -hmm. And here's something to think about. What if adversity isn't something to endure? what if it's here to serve us mm. to help us learn and grow and be more empathetic. And I am a far better person in many ways because of what I've been through, not in spite of it, because of it. Mm -hmm. And so I just feel like if we hide from adversity and challenges or even perceived failures, mm. you know, it makes us lose confidence and, and belief in ourselves and our purpose. Yeah. We start to feel less than we start to feel like failures Mm -hmm. And I think if we just embrace the tough times and learn from them and grow because of them, sometimes your purpose finds you because so many people are searching. What's my purpose? What am I doing here? Mm -hmm. Mine found me, Bernadette. I did not go searching for this. Trust me. Yeah. I'd rather that I wrote a cookbook and you and I could talk about that recipe yeah. on page 79. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I would just leave them with this rather than hating adversity, 
I think we should let it be that jet fuel mm. that propels you toward your purpose because I firmly believe that adversity is your superpower. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Beautifully said. I love it. I love it. Um, so two questions as we wrap up. The first one is, what is the meaning of life for you? What's the meaning of life? <laughs> yes. You know, can I just tell your listeners that if Bernadette were, you know, a really nice person, she would have given you that in advance so that you could, you know, research it and, you know, put it in spell check. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding you. You're a really nice person. <laughs> the meaning of life. Wow. Well, because of my spiritual beliefs, I think we are all here to be a reflection of God. Mm. And that means that we are here to serve. So in some way we're here to serve. I didn't say to be a doormat. Ooh, yeah. yeah. But we are all here to serve. Yeah. Another reason why you take that adversity, damn it, and you figure out how to use it to serve other people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Is absolutely. the next question going to be even deeper and harder? No, <laughs> it can be if you wanted to. <laughs> but yeah, my next question is where can people find your book and uh, get plugged in within the community you've built, you're building and continue to build? If you go to ValerieSilvera.com, Right there, you can find links to my books and podcast and my, my podcast is called Warriors and Hope. You mm -hmm. can find links to Warriors and Hope to join that community. Mm -hmm. um, I have an app where there's some free resources and where all of my other resources are delivered. So mm -hmm. I would say ValerieSilvera.com is the easiest way. And that the, even links to Amazon and even different country links to the different books. Mm, that's awesome. Well, Valerie, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for sharing your heart, your story, your journey, your pain, your joy. And thank you for transforming that for so many, so many women from all over the place. So many people. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It really, truly was my honor to spend this time with you. You're welcome.